radiant heating. Um, so, Neil, I'm okay, just going to do a quick introduction. Yeah. Quick, yeah. quick introduction. Thank you very much for attending tonight. Um, just very, very quickly, um, Neil and myself, Kurt Bracey, Neil Webb, um, very pleased to be here. Just a little background on Linda, very, very quickly, to say that um, we've been manufacturing, designing uh, rain panels, funny enough, from our days in solar design and, and materials. Uh, we have done, uh, we do chill beams, we do our VOB products and rules and fuses. As we can see, it's a very large company. In fact, it's out of date now, it's now 5,100 plus. Uh, we purchased a couple of companies this last year. Um, as we can see here, it's been around, we've been around for uh, a good 50 years. Um, so we hopefully we can provide you with the services uh, you require and information. And just as today, um, radiant ceilings, of course, cooling and heating, the passive rain devices and active job beams are our core products on our side of the business. Uh, you may well know it for other items such as uh, grills, diffusers, dampers, and of course that work. So, without further ado, I will pass over to Neil. Um, okay, before I start, um, obviously uh, we, we do these CPDs for quite a lot of um, companies, and um, we try to aim them at the right level of what people know and knowledge and, and very aware there's some senior guys in today so if any of this insults your intelligence I do apologise. <laughs> um, um, if there's any questions ask and uh, we'll we have a chat about so that will do it. If I press the right button. What's, what's going on here? I always like to start off writing an eating CPD with quite a big statement. Um, the statement is that you wouldn't get any life on earth without um, radiant heat from the sun. Um, and obviously along with water and oxygen um, on the Earth, it's what sustains uh, life on the planet. Um, and the um, radiant heat from the sun um, varies in the intensity depending where we are on the planet. So obviously if you're at the equator and the sun's high, then um, it's very, very hot and it's very intense. Um, and it makes life difficult to sustain in those sort of conditions. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got the, uh, you've got the poles where less intensity. And again, you're struggling to keep, uh, to keep sustain life in those sorts of environments. So what all the hell, what sort of hell, the hell has this got to do with designing a radiant panel system? Well, we want our occupants in the room to be in comfortable conditions. We don't want them living at the equator or the Sahara. Oh, we don't want them living at the pole, so we want them to be nice and comfortable, Western Europe, somewhere like that. So, um, and because the sun is radiant heat, it has a relevance to what we do. Only one place to start, really. What is radiant heat? Whoops, we'll go backwards. Oh, I do apologise. Okay, so radiant heat is actually light, um, and it's on the light spectrum between ultraviolet and infrared. Um, and it shines down through the air with, uh, invisibly, um, and it strikes surfaces, and those surfaces absorb the, the heat, the radiant heat, um, and those surfaces re-emit. Um, so the radiant heat is exchanged with them surfaces, and those surfaces re-emit um, in convective, or they reflect the radiant heat to other surfaces um, and generally bounce around and sort of generate uh, a reasonable environment on that. I'll try and get these buttons the right way around, guys. Yeah, so what they do, and the idea, what we're looking for on the radiant heating design is for us to warm the surfaces. Um, so you warm the floor, you warm the ceilings, uh, you warm the walls and the floors. And we increase the temperature of those surfaces so that we, uh, the occupants of the room, don't lose heat to them surfaces so quickly. So we're reducing the temperature difference between ourselves and the external walls and the floors so that we're keeping the heat ourselves and we're not losing it to them surfaces. As I say, it bounces around people. Um, a lot of the seminars I do, we've got a big table in the middle of the room and everybody says, well, how does the radiant heat get under there? Well, 
it bounces around um, and it reflects and absorbs and goes under the table. Because it's light, I always sort of say, well, light gets under the table, it's never dark under there, and it gets under there the same way, radiant heat gets under there the same way as light would. <coughs> so why would we choose a, a radiant panel system over um, perhaps a convective air system? Um, so one of the popular um, uses of it in a hospital or a, um, an education facility is that most of the equipment tends to be one against the wall, so you'll put your heating elements in the ceiling, they're out of the way, and it means you can uh, put your equipment around the perimeter of the room. Um, and then once you've got those heat, heat emitters at high level, it means that it's a safer environment because all that heat is out of the way of people, so you can't, the occupants can't burn themselves. And generally they can't be knocked either, so um, the, uh, the maintenance is low because generally they're not going to get damaged, uh, whereas a radiator will get kicked and knocked and pushed. Um, lower installation costs. Um, if you've got an, uh, um, a facility where you need um, an LSD and you have to pipe in uh, boxing pipe work, um, then that's quite an expensive sort of um, trade. So it can be more cost effective to put radiant panels in the ceiling where the pipe work is, the mains of the pipe work is anyway. When I talk about um, this, we, we're talking about best practice really, and I know that as, as um, professionals working in this industry, we all have different um, um, pressures for, uh, for other things in this industry, so commercial <laughs> pressures, we all have um, pressures about uh, physically getting these products into the into the environment. So I'm just I'm talking best practice here. I know we all have to take a few other issues into account. So some of the other benefits is that radiant panels um, have a, a lower design temperature. So um, a 21 degree um, air temperature is equivalent to 18 degree radiant temperature, and you can use that three degree temperature difference. Um, to save energy uh, on your plant, uh, reduce your plant size because um, obviously you can use it as your infiltration loss, so you save it three degrees on your infiltration losses, so you're reducing your heat loss. It also has a quicker response time, so generally if you're working on a convective radiator system, you would put um, a boost up period in it, so perhaps 20% on your heat loss, so that you can turn the building on, uh, your heating system on, an hour before the building is occupied, so it's going to warm up. Whereas with a radiant panel, as soon as that panel starts getting hot, it starts emitting, emitting heat. So generally, within five minutes, you're getting 65% of your energy, that's your radiant proportion of your panel, and then the rest comes on board um, after that. So that warm-up time is greatly reduced, perhaps from 60 minutes to five minutes. You get a more even temperature with it. So with a convective uh, radiator system, for instance, you get hot air which stratifies um, at the ceiling. Um, and generally, people always say to me, oh, radiant panels, hot air, cold feet. It's actually a convective air system is more likely to have that because your hot air pulls at the ceiling um, and hot air rises from the floor, so your feet become cold on it. Whereas with a radiant system, you tend to have a very small gradient because it's warming all the surfaces on the floor, you will have a very small gradient between the temperature of the ceiling and the temperature of the floor. And this provides a better working environment for your, uh, for your occupants. And then a bit at the end, direct energy savings and a better carbon footprint. If you take into account resultant temperature, three degrees lower than air temperature, and you take into account five, five minute warm-up time instead of a third, 60 minute warm-up time, then it reduces the size of your plant um, so, uh, and it reduces the amount of heat loss that you calculate so then you reduce the size of your plant and your energy use. Just to say that 21 degrees air temperature um, against 18 degrees resultant radiant temperature has the same comfort levels, that's what, uh, that's what the literature says about it. Um, one of the other advantages is because it goes through the air or it, um, it radiates through the air without moving the air around, um, there's less convection with it. So if you've got allergy sufferers um, or you've got, you're working in a, an environment like a hospital where there's bugs and germs around, then it's not 
uh, mixing those contaminants in the air so much as a convective system would do. So it's generally going to be a cleaner environment. Um, one of my previous employers, we, we did a project which was um, a yacht manufacturing where Mr. Abramovich went and got his ocean going yachts and they got a four metre keel on these yachts and because there was a woodworking shop next to it and they was, they was using adhesive to stick the, la, um, the um, laminate uh, timber to the keel, they wanted an even temperature because the adhesive was going off at different, uh, different temperatures at four metres high. And also, he didn't want any contaminants moving around because you've got sawdust and everything. So if you get sawdust between your laminate panel on your adhesive, then it didn't stick so well. So the radiant heating became a really good option for him to, uh, to heat his premises on there. Um, quieter, I mean, that's on the basis of quieter than it's a, a, a forced air system, but um, similar to a radiator system on that kind of stuff. <coughs> Uh, the last one, saving and cleaning maintenance bills. Again, because there's less convection, you don't get so much dust circulated, so generally it's sort of uh, a little bit more clean, cleaner environment on that. So what I'm going to do now is I've got some samples in, as you can see, like a scrapyard here, but i um, got some samples in. Um, <clears throat> the first two up, um, the uh, construction on the left-hand side is probably 90% of radiant panels in the UK. Um, and you take a sheet of aluminium or you take a sheet of steel and you put uh, an aluminium um, carrier extrusion on it and then you put a copper, a copper pipe into that extrusion and then you put insulation on the back of it and that's a pretty simple construction on it. There's a few things that are worth, worth noting about that. One of them is aluminium is a better conductor so generally um, aluminium is a better uh, better material than steel. There are a few people who do steel out there, but generally aluminium is going to give you a higher um, heat transfer, so better efficiency. The aluminium extrusion is adhered to the back of the, uh, back of the panel. Um, people use all sorts of ways of doing that, um, uh, heat conducting tape, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then your, your pipe work goes into your extrusion. Uh, some people I know roll the pipe work in, so again, that's sort of closing down. Uh, gives it um, a better contact between the pipe work and the aluminium extrusion. And some people put heat transfer paste and all sorts of ways to, to improve the contacts, uh, the contact between the, the, the parts of the network. Unfortunately, that is the one panel that I don't have a sample of, so I can't show you, show you that one, but I would promise to get one eventually. Um, the next panel along is probably <clears throat> another quite, um, quite popular way of doing it, and this works if I make this on this chair. So this is a plank, 150 millimetre plank, so 75, 150 millimetre. And if anybody's done any, um, any flooring, you sort of put it together and clip it, clip it together. And that's the way this works. So the extrusions are clipped together and then that forms um, an orifice in your extrusion through which a copper pipe is threaded and then soldered up as normal. <coughs> and as you can see, it's fairly um, uh, fairly good construction, but you can move the pipes on it, so the heat transfer is not great because once you've got an air gap, then the heat transfer is not so good. So it's not, it's not great, but it's, it's fairly good construction on it. You put the insulation in, in, in between and that. The idea of the insulation around your panels to ensure that you get most of the energy through the front face because you don't want it going up in your ceiling void because that's uh, nobody up there. So. Um, yeah, uh, the only disadvantage of this is a 3mm extrusion, so that panel, Kirk and I was nearly breaking out back earlier with it, um, it's very, very heavy, so really heavy construction. What I'll do, please come have a look at them afterwards and we'll, we'll compare them and we'll have, a, have a feel with them. Um, <clears throat> so that's the two. So this one is, uh, so 90% of manufactured like that, I should think, another 5% of that. And then we, as a manufacturer, do a couple of different ways of doing it. <coughs> and this isn't really a Linda, um, obviously, this is a, an industry presentation, but I always think this is quite an interesting way of showing how we do this. So this is um, our atrium panel, and this, these are the waterways here. Um, and this is done by bonding two sheets of aluminium and copper together, and then blowing compressed air through it, and it forms this diamond-shaped waterway. And 
that forms, so it's part of your face plate. So you get really, really good heat transfer from it. Um, and then this is made in a plank system as well, so it's a folded off aluminium plank. And then you just bolt it together and you've got this with a 6 lead wide. And then it's got a 10 mil pipe to it, so just connect your connections up to it. This is really lightweight. This is, uh, I mean, I can do a 6 metre long panel in this in one piece, less than 18 kilograms. So uh, it's a really lightweight construction. And then on the other side, um, this one's similar to the first one, so you take just a sheet of aluminium, um, and this is laser welded, so it's directly welded to the face plate and still through the extrusion. So again, you get really good um, contact between your pipe work and your, and your face plate. And this is really important because the heat transfer is, is important about your output for your panel, so it depends how, um, you know, that's what gives you your output. Uh, which when we fall onto it is what's, what's important. Is that continuous well? That, that one's not continuous well, yeah, for the whole pipe. Yeah. It's a laser welder, um, it's a picture of it over there. I've not actually seen it yet, so I'm in Sweden, but uh, hopefully I get a trip out there. Um, <clears throat> this is really, um, this is one of our competitors, I'm pleased to say. This is a um, sort of, um, it's a plank system. Um, and as part of the plank, you've got a half round um, extrusion on it, and then they click the pipe work in, and they've got um, some paste in there. But as you can see, and we'll come on later about this, about the output, as you can see, there's not a lot of pipe touching the extrusion in a 600 millimeter long panel. So you know the efficiency of that is, is pretty rotten, pretty rotten really. Um, and then on top of that, they've got. A, that's the sort of thing they give back to the London Marathon, isn't it? Um, <coughs> something different about the um, Anyway, you know, I've got to show all the all types. There's lots of types out there, so uh, it's just some examples. Well. The main essence of the construction of the radiant panel is we're trying to get the most efficient temperature, um, temperature into the face of the panel to give us the most output. So we'll come on to output now. Um, so 65% of output from a radiant panel is radiant and 35% is convective. Um, now the radiant proportion of uh, a heating panel, a radiant heating panel is a scientific, um, is a, is a scientific equation. You cannot get more heat out of a panel than you put into it. Some manufacturers will have you believe that you can. But generally a radiant panel is going to be Temperature face plate is going to be somewhere between your mean water, depending on how efficient your radiant panel construction is. Um, and the law is a Stefan Boltzmann law, and it started by Joseph Stefan and finished up by Boltzmann. So they, um, the one did the, did the research and the other one sort of finalised it. And it's uh, whatever proportional to the fourth power of the surface temperature in Kelvin. I don't really understand what that means, but I just know that it's dependent on the surface temperature of the panel is what gives you your output. And then the convective proportion, 35% of it, um, that is um, slightly different um, depending on what the depth is of your radiant panel. So this one here being 60 millimetres deep will have slightly more convective output than this one here at 25 millimetres deep. And that's purely because you're getting higher, you're getting the stack effect on it, so you're getting a little bit. But it's, in the, in the realms of things, it's, it's only a tiny bit more proportion. <coughs> um, all radiant panels should and possibly are um, manufactured and um, calibrated to EN14037. So uh, about five or six years ago, um, there was a lot of um, spurious um, data about how much a radiant panel would admit. So the EU, being, um, being that they are, they decided to unify a test for all radiant panels, and they call it EN14037. Um, and every product that's sold in the UK should have should be tested to that. Every product isn't, but it should be. And it all should, also should have a, a coat mark, CE mark as well. Um, and there's three, well, there's actually four parts now to EN14037. Part one is the construction of the panel. So um, in this case, our EN14031 certificate says you take an aluminium sheet, 
you use copper pipe and it, you tell it to say that you bond it to the panel and that forms part, part one of your certificate. We don't actually publish it um, our EM1407 certificates for so we consider it to be um, private but anybody who's welcome to come and have a look at them, I thought you would most say welcome to have a look at them. Um, <clears throat> so the second part, so you tell it the first part how you're going to construct it. Part of the construction also say, talks about deflections, so there are, there are limits to how much your panel deflects. Um, and again, that's uh, I think it's 10 millimetres one way and um, 20 millimetres the other way. So 10 millimetres um, uh, on the faceplate. So 10 millimetres dropping on the faceplate. Then that expands and contracts and it's full of hot water. And then 20 millimetres the other way. So that's um, yeah, cross across on it. So. Second part of, of it is. It describes how you set up your test cell to test your radiant panel. So the test cell, there's only one um, test cell in Europe that can issue a 14037 certificate, and that's in Stuttgart. Um, and it tells you how you, you set that test cell up. So if it's three meters high, you mount your radiant panel on a concrete soffit. You cool your wall to a certain temperature, which we don't know offhand, uh, but you cool your wall to a certain temperature. And then you um, test your product to three different mean waters um, at a set flow rate, 0 0.022. And then you take the three tests, um, uh, yeah, you take your return water temperature and calculate what your output is. You put it on a chart, draw a line through it. And then when it hits 56 degrees C as a mean water temperature, um, you're allowed to take that reading, and that reading is uh, part of the EN14037. So, um, again, on our certificate, it says that a three metre long panel does 976 watts, and you're allowed to take that 976 watts, divide it by three metres, and use that watts per linear metre as your um, default um, output for your radiant heating panel. And the reason why that's quite important is that. If you're using 300 watts of the meter and your point work's not connected and you've got a 600 long panel, you've only actually got 200 long times point, you know, point 0.2 times point 0.3, you've only got 60 watts from that. Whereas really your, panel, your um, 300 watts times 600 would give you 180. So that's why it's important to have heat transfer and to have the point work covering the whole face of the panel because. Um, Proportionally, on a 6 inch, it's really bad, but even on other smaller panels, it's, uh, on bigger panels, it's, you want the whole of your panel to be active. <coughs> so, I've got my 376 watts per linear metre, and that's giving me the output. Um, now, at the moment, uh, due out next year is um, part four of the in 14037 test. And that's going to take into account free hanging uh, panels. You obviously get more convective heat from a free hanging panel. Um, and it's also going to talk about cool roof casting as well. So it's yet to be published, but it's on its way. So once I've got my um, watts per linear meter, um, I put it into a graph. Um, manufacturers do it different ways. Some people tabulate it. We put it into a graph, um, which is an example here. Um, and as a, um, what we do is we indicate radiant, the radiant proportion. So um, if we take a 600 <coughs> wide panel here, so this is 50 delta T. We take um, radiation at 600 wide, read it across, and that gives me 200 watts per linear meter. Um, and then if you take it up to the EN14037 line, that gives me 300 watts per linear meter. And then if you take it up to the free hanging line, that will give you 350 watts. So that's how you um, do your design, when you calculate the design on that. And as you, say, we, as you can see, we've got three different widths on that, so we're giving it a, um, a reading on every single width. So up for the mean water, and then across for your, for your area. <coughs> um, I did a, one of these seminars um, a couple of weeks back, a couple of months back now, um, and people were asking me about radiant temperature asymmetry. 
Um, now any um, schools that are EFA funded um, need to um, correspond with a radiant temperature symmetry of less than 10 degrees, which is in the EFA document. Um, <clears throat> everything we do is um, for an RTA is 5 degrees. Um, and the reason we do that is um, because with a, a radiant temperature symmetry of 5 degrees, that equals um, PPD of 4%. But if you go to 10 degrees, it's 20% dissatisfied. So we think 5 degrees is better, 4% dissatisfied is better than 20% dissatisfied. Um, and that's what we publish. Now, radiant temperature symmetry is measured um, on a metal surface, uh, 1.1 from the, from the radiant panel, or 600 from the radiant panel, and it's the temperature difference between the face plate, the face of the panel, and the underside of the panel. Um, and it varies depending on the positioning of the panel and the temperature of the panel. Um, so obviously the further apart they are, um, the higher the temperature difference between the face and the underside, the closer they are, um, the closer the temperature difference. And this is the mathematical equation <coughs> of how you work that out. And skip it on quickly, because that's hard. Um, but generally these days, if you've got IES or EDSL, they're going to work all this out for you. You put the proportion of radiance into your into your model, and it'll tell you it'll work on that sort of thing. Out for you anyway, so. um, it's only Eric and I who remember the old time when we took part of the equations out. Didn't we? <laughs> so, um, radiant temperature symmetry of five, five degrees. It's about the positioning of the panel and the temperature of the panel, uh, and the mountain height of the panel. So if we start with positioning of pa radiant panels, so what this graph shows you is um, install height down on the, on the bottom, so 3 metres, 4 metres, 5 metres, and then dis distance from the outside wall. So what it's telling me here is that at 3 metres it should be 1.2 from the wall. Now the reason that is, is because um, a radiant panel 1.2 from the wall shines down at 45 degrees. So that means it strikes the wall at 1.8 metres above finished floor, floor height. Now that's deemed as uh, the occupied zone. So um, that 1.8 is your occupied zone. So 1.2 is shining down at 45 degrees. That's 1.8, that's your occupied zone. And what that means is that it's going to heat that wall from there to there, um, three or four degrees, five degrees possibly, higher than the rest of the wall. But if it's a window wall, it means it's going to heat your window as well. And it means that I'm not going to lose my heat to that window so quickly because temperature difference is going down. So that's the first dimension. Second one is in between. Uh, and the in-between of take three metres again, it's saying 2.5. And again, that is, is because if you've got two panels shining down there and they're both shining in the middle, you want it to hit 1.8 and you want that radiant panel, uh, radiant effect to meet at 1.8 above your head. So this is covering the occupied zone again. Now remember I said this is best practice and I know it is quite difficult sometimes to do this, um, but um, this is best practice and this is what we should endeavour to try and, try and develop in our design. <coughs> so the next thing is um, panel width um, and panel mounting height. Now remember just briefly at the beginning I talked about the intensity of uh, the radiant heat from the sun and about how it makes such a big difference in the environment that we live in. Well, if we've got a bigger panel, a wider radiant panel above our heads, then that heat, the intensity of the heat from that panel is, more, is likely to be more uncomfortable. So what uh, we publish is um, the width of the panel on the right hand side. Um, on the bottom it's got surface temperature of the panel. So this is the surface temperature. Now my EN14037 certificate tells me that a radiant panel temperature with a mean water at 70 is going to be 65 degrees. So it loses 5 degrees heat transfer between the water, mean water and the surface of the temperature. So if you take 65, and then if we take the third line up, 600 millimetres, that one there, 
come across here and it tells me that um, minimum mounting height is 2.7. <laughs> minimum mounting height for a 600 wide panel is 2.7 with a, it's the surface temperature 65 for radiant panel. There's a big job in Birmingham at the moment, it's a radiant panel job and there's a contractor got the job and uh, I've quoted it four times and every time I've done it I've said you shouldn't mount radiant panel 600 wide at a mean water of uh, was it 80 70, so 75 degrees and the mounting height is 2.2 metres and 2.4 metres um, and that's likely to be very uncomfortable, um, uncomfortable to, to the big room. And what I've suggested is you should go to a 330 up to 65 and then that will tell you that you've got um, a 330 wide you can make them at two metres without causing discomfort, so that's still giving you five degree radiant temperature symmetry. Okay, is everybody straight up? Does that make sense? This, um, <coughs> this graph is for radiant panels 3.6 metres, so um, it's for small radiant, radiant panels on that. If you've got a panel 10 metres above, um, then the height goes up because the intensity is in the length as well. Um, so sports halls and stuff like that, generally it's not usually a problem. But. So just briefly recapping on that, so a radiant panel shines down, um, it's radiant heat at 45, 45 degrees, and we're trying to warm the surfaces um, of the occupied zone above head height so that we're all sitting comfortably in our in the Mediterranean instead of um, the South Pole. <laughs> Probably a bit more than you know, um, What I did is a little experiment. I, I sort of did a couple of quick, quick calculations. And this is a cross section of a, uh, of a classroom. So it's a 56 square meter classroom. And this is, if we put two panels in the classroom, uh, that's the sort of spacing you'd have for them. And that's your effect of radiant heat. And that's your, that's your deemed occupied zone. And that's 900 millimetres. So what the effect of that is that when your class is sitting, sitting there and it's only warm to 900 millimetres, it means that all that part is colder than that part of the wall. So it means that the people sitting against this wall are going to be cold because of the, you're going to lose temperature really quickly to that. So really what you should do, um, guys with all apologies, this is what people want to pay for. <laughs> so we're a bit cold. Uh, but this really is what we should do. So three panels, and that gives us a mounting height of 1.8. It's not strictly true because, uh, oh, sorry, it's, yeah, it should be at 1.5, but it's closer than, so it's going to come to here instead of sitting down here. So that's going to be all comfortable. It means that students in the classroom sitting along this cold wall, or their bats to it, aren't going to be so cold, so you're going to be <coughs> oh, I'll just have a quick look. I talked a lot about um, mounting heights. Radiant heating, um, low pressure hot water radiant heating is really, really effective in high bay areas. Uh, I've done um, 70 degree mean water, I've done 32 meter mounting height. Um, and what happens? Um, the intensity isn't so strong, but it still warms the surfaces up because hot still goes to cold, so it still works at that temperature. And there's massive advantages to using um, LPHW radiant panels in large spaces. Remember, um, it doesn't heat the air up, so if you've got a big volume of air and your radiant, panel, radiant heat isn't heating that volume of air, then it means that your heat losses are lower. <laughs> um, of your infiltration on it. You've got a much smaller gradient, so if it's six metres mounting height, you've still got a smaller gradient than you would for a, um, for a convective system. You can use high water temperatures, miss that one, you can use high water temperatures, so it's all out the way, so you can increase your water temperatures if you want to. Although, really, these days, you know, there's usually enough at, at sort of standard construction, uh, standard um, water temperatures. <clears throat> um, low design space temperatures. So EM 1283, the one different, but it's 
familiar with that. That's, this is a heat loss British standard. So again, if you, if you reference that, um, instead of trusting to IES or EDSL, then you'll note that it says that if you've got an, a radiant proportion of that, um, it'll calculate your radiant proportion, and you'll get lower um, heat loss requirements um, on that basis. So this is uh, just a, a brief diagram of, of what I've just tried to be explaining. So the top model is, um, so this is a factory unit, seven meters high, and the top model is, uh, we're trying to get 18 degrees in there, so that's 18 degrees air temperature. Um, so we've put a couple of cheap um, gas-fired air heaters in there, uh, and as we all know, hot air rises, um, and um, from the temperature gradient there, to get the occupied zone to 18 degrees, it means that the air in the roof is in excess of 25 degrees. So that's what this, thank you Kurt, that's what this gradient is showing there. Um, and it's also telling, it's telling me there that the temperature gradient is between 1 and 1.4 uh, degrees per metre. So that's 7 metres, that could be anything between 7 to 8.4 degrees temperature difference. Um, which would make it actually 23.5 degrees instead of excess of 25, but anyway, you get the, you get the gist of it. Um, and then below that, um, same building, we're looking for 15 degrees resultant temperature because that's equivalent to 18 degrees air temperature. Um, and as you can see from the gradient there, you're not heating the air, so what it does is it, it shines down, strikes the floor, warms the floor up, floor up, and we're getting 15 degrees in the occupied zone for that. And the temperature gradient on that is 0.1 to 0.4, so um, 0.7 degrees to 2.8 degrees. And then on the right hand side, if you put those two um, profiles on top of one another, all that bit in the middle is what your customer or our customers are paying for, um, which really could be saved by using a radiant heating system. So it's a really, really efficient energy <coughs> system at the moment. So I hear you say prove it. Okay, well, so there's a couple of um, uh, light sensitive, uh, heat sensitive um, photographs, spit it out. Uh, so on the left hand side, this is before, before the, um, before the diet. Um, so this is uh, this convective heat system. So as you can see from the, um, from the color gradient, temperature gradient, that it's very, very warm at all. Uh, all the hot air has risen, and uh, where your occupied zone is, it's, uh, it's cold, uh, down to 8 degrees, 9 degrees. Um, and then on the other side, after a radiant panel system is installed, the same factory, it's the Siemens factory in Dusseldorf, that's just care of one of my previous employers. Um, as you can see, a lot more even temperature gradients on it, so um, down to the occupied zone. And that really hot shiny piece there which is in excess of uh, 16 degrees is a train so that train is absorbing all that heat, radiant heat from, from the radiant panel and it's re-emitting really it to become a radiator in its own right so a really good um, even spread of temperature I've got a few examples of this but I think this is the best one this is a really good, good example of how, it, of how well it works what do you want to do for trains? Um, I suspect it's a piece of metal or something. Metal tends to be the biggest conductor, so it's probably a handrail or something, perhaps. Uh, I think it might be a handrail or something, I'm not quite too sure. It's more or less taken from the same same place, I think. So, oh, sorry, this is, um, this is it there, so sure. perhaps it's something on the wall or something. Could be a painting floor, yeah. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps it absorbs the heat better than the, the surface layer. Yeah. I love the uh, heat, heat sensitive photographs. I think it's chilled ceiling ones, and you can see all the chilled water going through the pump. So fascinating. Okay, so uh, we've talked about some positioning. Um, we're going to talk about some other things we need to take into consideration when we're designing a radiant panel system. Uh, I think one of the main ones, um, uh, one of the main um, problems I seem to encounter with radiant panel systems is that 
people don't put enough water through them. So um, you must always have turbulent flow. You all must always have 6,000 um, Reynolds number going through your radiant power to get turbulent flow. Otherwise, um, if it's laminar, you don't get 100% of the transfer from, from your water. So to show you how important that is, we like at the moment to design at 20 degree delta 2, so 80, 60 to become a very common, 70 to 50 as well. Um, so at 20 degree delta T uh, between your water flow and your return temperatures, um, if your panel is smaller than 3 metres, you need to increase your flow rate to get turbulent flow. Because 20 degree temperature equates to around 900, 900 watts, something like that. So if you've designed a radiant panel system and you've got lots of 1200 and 1800 panels in it, each one of those would need to be increase the flow rate to get flow, uh, turbulent flow through it. And turbulent flow, we, we stipulate turbulent flow as 0 0.012 kilograms per second or meters per second. Most manufacturers will give you some sort of, some sort of indication on that. 0 0.011, 0 0.012, and 0.012. Yeah, yeah. yeah, generally, um, uh, again, our previous employer, we used to do 10 mil pipe, and we used to say 0 0.008. Now, um, that's probably true, but when you're talking about such small amounts of water, it's controlling, which is, a, which is as much an issue as, as, as anything else. You know, how you control between 0 0 0.008 and Zero it's, it's really difficult. So if that goes slightly out of the pump, so you have to slightly out of the pump, you know, slightly more elevated than the temperature as well. Yeah. yeah. I just we're just uh, looking at the hospital and um, the TBNO, the consultants, and they've designed all their radiant panels. They're all 1200 by 600 and 600 by 600, and they've designed them all at 0 0.02 flow rate um, and really low temperature, 73 flow. So. Um, set flow rate and set uh, flow temperature, so the return temperature varies depending on what the, on the output requirement is. So <coughs> it's a really good way of doing it because as your temperature goes down on your panel, or your requirement goes down on your panel, you still maintain a, um, a flow rate. Well, you still maintain a turbulent flow rate. On it. So. But it's it's one of the biggest things that um, I've been to a lot of jobs that people say these panels aren't getting hot enough. And the reason is is because um, it's laminar and you're not getting 100% um, heat, um, heat transfer. And just to give you an idea, that's about 20% of your capacity. So you're only doing 80% of your heat capacity. So this controller is going to be an issue regulate the flow rate. It's very difficult to control those such low flow rates. Yeah. 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 Uh, minimum maximum product size, well we talked about that a little bit about mounting heights and temperatures and stuff like that. Um, product selection, well again that's important. I've just shown you a few examples here of, of panels. Yeah. Um, it's quite, always quite interesting to uh, you know, lots of people, lots of manufacturers have different things. Um, and this one here, I mean, I've said how heavy it is and robust it is. And I used to use this for um, uh, mental health projects. And um, I don't think anybody's done a mental health project, but they had a, um, uh, a destruction test. So they'd take a radiant panel and they'd bash it for 10 weeks with a rubber mallet and then they'd bash it with a chair leg and then they'd bash it with something else. And the blokes would come off like that. And they'd see what the damage is on the panel. And, uh, you get a certificate to sign you for the passing. So, um, I've seen a, a guy go purple, a crown ace, kind of crash his way to a radio car because they need it to, uh, as a destruction test on a, uh, on a major health system. So, um, so, yeah, so it's important, you know, there's lots of different products out there, so it's important <laughs> to get the right one for what you're looking for. Um, headers, now, um, uh, there's a lot of industrial manufacturers, manufactured radio panels out there, so, heavy steel gauge ones um, and they come with a header and what you can do is you can use a header to distribute your water down a number of waterways. Um, again, I used to work at Zender and they do a ZDN and it goes up to 12 pipes wide and you can run water through six pipes and then back through six pipes and you can do these for like 100 metres long um, 
So a header will give you some versatility um, about capacity and length on, on the panel. So, um. Next one's always a bit thorny, and I'm um, uh, sort of going there in a bit of trepidation. It's um, uh, constant flow variable temperature. So um, if, you, um, if you're looking for turbulent flow, you always want your panel to be turbulent. Um, so you keep it as a constant flow rate and you vary the temperature of it. So a radiant panel, um, as soon as it's, it goes off, then it's like the sun, we talked about the sun earlier, it's like the sun going behind the cloud. Immediately you feel the effect of the air temperature without the radiant temperature. So you might be cold on it. Um, so what you would like to try and do is cool the, t cool the, panels, um, cool the panels slower. So reduce the temperature onto the panel, but keep the flow rate, so you've still got your turbulent capacity. So what you do is you mix your, you put a mixing circuit in, and you mix your return water so that you reduce your flow temperature. And you always keep your panel warm, or warmer and warmer, until it becomes insignificant, and then it'll, and then it'll go down and then just turn off. Um, I know a lot of the um, perceived ideas at the moment is to vary the flow with a, um, an inverter on the pump and things like that, but really a radiant panel works better with a constant flow rate and vary the temperature of the water to the panel because that's, um, the panel works better on that basis. And then the panel is always on because it's always warm. Now again, I know this is, you know, this is best practice, but I, mean, I, I know there's a lot of things that dictate whether you can do that and how you do that. But that's the ideal. That's the ideal way of a radiant panel system working. Last one, cooling integration. We um, we actually do this panel in a four pipe system, so you get an integral coil for cooling and one for heating. Um, there's a lot, lot more um, passive cooling these days. Um, if you've got a reverse cycle heat pump, something like that, then you can give your clients a little bit of cooling as well. Um, Generally, if you design a radiant panel system on, uh, for an output for radiant panel, you're never going to get your cooling loads, but um, what you might do is it might knock a few degrees off. Um, that's uh, critical times. If it's a, a school or a classroom or something, it will give you some thermal lag, which, um, which might give you your less than 28, 20 days, 28 days over 28 degrees that you get in your PFI um, school rooms, things like that. So you can you can put, you can integrate uh, cooling into them as well. A couple more things that we talked about: um, fabric losses. So again, if we design around the resultant radiant temperature, we're reducing our fabric losses because the temperature difference between the perceived temperature inside and the external is lower. Uh, we talked about mountain height and design temperatures. Air change is quite important. Now, um, radiant heating doesn't heat the air, as I mentioned before. So if you've got a naturally ventilated building, or you've got a building where you've got a lot of air change, a laboratory, something like that, radiant heating isn't going to be your thing because uh, it's not going to heat your, it's not going to heat your air changes. Um, above two and a half, three, three air changes an hour. So if you've got a lot of air changes, then radiant heating is not going to work because it's not going to heat it. Or you have to temper your your heat change. So if you bring your heat changes in, you have to, uh, sorry, your air changes in, you have to temper it with, with some sort of heat because your radio panels aren't going to heat it. Unless I have done a job where um, the fresh air has come into the ceiling board, we take the insulation off the radio panel and that convective heat of the radio panel has warmed up the air that's in the, that's in the oil and then it's been pressurised. So you have to take pressure, uh, precautions to, to provide some sort of tempered temper into your fresh air if you've got high um, air changes. Rooms above 3.5 to 3.5. The reason that's, uh, that's in there is because if your room is bigger than that, you probably need to put two radiant panels in to get your coverage. Um, now that's a bit sort of because rooms that size don't tend to be always <coughs> occupied, so I would always sort of govern that with, depends what your room's doing, so if it's a store room or a WC or something like that. It doesn't really matter because people like to sit around in there, so the comfort levels aren't as, as important as they are as if people are always going to be sitting, um, sitting around at desks or at uh, yeah. or hospital beds and so on. 
insulation side. Um, most radio panels have an insulation on the back. Um, and most manufacturers will use um, polystyrene, as you can see. Uh, that one's got foam on it, um, but mineral wool as well. Um, I did some PF5 stores up in Lancashire and I went to an exam meeting in Bogus and they said we want to use sheep's wool because it's naturally available and it's from Lancashire and stuff like that. So, and he said, Is it going to smell good? But um, that, was their, that was their requirement, was, uh, they wanted locally sourced uh, insulation and that, that's what I asked for. I didn't win the job in the end, so I don't know if you would, but uh, that was. Uh, Next one's an interesting one, thermostatic uh, controlling, control valves on it. Now again, I come back to what people want to pay for and what you should, do, should actually use. If you're designed to result in temperature, 18 degrees, you should really control to result in temperature with a black ball. Um, but an air, te air thermostat's obviously a lot cheaper. Um, and as long as you've got adjustments on it, you can adjust it for your result in temperature. So as long as it's not an on-off um, thermostat, you can you can vary it or you can adjust it to take into account your your resultant temperature against your air temperature. And it's important to be able to do that because if you design a radiant panel system, um, I, I see them all the time. Um, you'll get some documents from a client and he'll say, "I want um, uh, an air, a room temperature 21 degrees, uh, sorry, winter temperature 21 degrees plus or minus one one degree." and you're designed to 21 degrees and put a radiant panel system in which is really 18 degrees but that means with three degrees on top of your 21 it's actually going to be 24 so you'll overheat in that in that space so when you're controlling it you really want to be able to use that three degrees so you can take that off and not overheat the space because it is stuffy i would always recommend a black bulb on a high base system so if it's at five meters something like that I recommend a, a black hole on that. And then generally, it's, a, it's generally cost effective as well because you've mm. usually got a huge area like sports or something, so you haven't got loads and loads of thermostats, so it's worth the expenditure. And the bottom one there, Master Shield pre commission valves. Uh, people like Frey's do a pre commission valve, so this is useful if you've made a radio panel at five metres, you've set the commission with flow rate, and it means you don't have to keep moving up and down to it. So it's just a so that's pretty much it. Um, just got a few pictures of some installs, um, which aren't particularly exciting, but I'm sure you've all seen the radio panel and seen them before. Um, this one's um, obviously they're taking care of the uh, heat loss from the windows there, so the radio panel's right pressed against the window, I think, the window. Um, and then there's nothing further out from there, so I do wonder how that's, you know, sitting here, how are you going to feel on that, but... This sports on soil, just recently done. Another one I've been uh, hold. Some plumbing and soil. Excuse me, I'm freaking lazy. Um, with that, we, uh, we used to sell these via reseller in the UK, and uh, we did that for five, five hospitals with Skanska. Um, so this is at Sir Commentary, um, Allsworth Hospital. Um, one of the things with um, uh, radium heated is, um, because it's light, um, we want the same space as the electricians do, so we want to put our radium panels where they put their lights, because it has the same properties, um, so we we can certainly manufacture um, radiant panels, and we just cut an aperture in the panel and put a light in it. Become a little bit more complicated lately with LEDs. With T fives, it wasn't a problem, um, but with LEDs, uh, with the heat in the panel, we have to have a little bit more thought to it um, to bridge it, or bridge it, make sure it don't get too hot. Did you say that three hundred panels are efficient? Freehand, yeah. Because you get more convective air, so if you put it in the ceiling, you restrict the convection on it. So um, when you remove the ceiling, it's, it allows all the air to uh, uh, the hot air to rise up around the and the edges. So just convection the high level, so it's high level. So it's not just as high level. That convection means it's not Well, no, but what happens? Um, 
it, it works like a displacement system does. So what it does, if you warm, the, if it conventionally warm, warms the floor up, um, and you've got a hotter area above at, at the ceiling height, it stops the temperature. It stops the uh, so you're reducing the temperature difference between the occupied zone and higher level. So it means that you your air, your hot air rises slower. Your reconvective hot air. So it's like a displacement system. A displacement system works on the temperature difference. So if you heat up the, the ceiling, then the temperature, you, you reduce the temperature difference. And it means that the, the warm air and the warm surfaces don't lose the temp heat so much, so quickly to the, to the um, area of the panels. And that's, that's, that's a pretty ugly light, lighting job. That's, uh, this is one we're looking at for some schools at the moment. Perforated. Um, Again, um, school, uh, with a school classroom, we have a thing called BB93, which is um, speech intelligibility. So it means that um, when the teacher's standing in front of the class, little Johnny at the back can understand what the, he's saying or she's saying. So um, a radio panel with um, perforations on it and acoustic material behind it will give you, um, will reduce reverberation time. So that's what we're doing here, we're putting light fittings in and reducing the reverberation time. Hope, fingers crossed, good job. Uh, just uh, we've just done this school up in Port and I uh, went to the classroom, I thought, oh, that's a nice, nice photographs of it, and it's a pretty horrible installation, <laughs> I saw it. So a white radiant panel, an atrium, uh, with an acoustic light fitting. Um, it's called uh, Whitecroft, they call it a foil. Um, and this has got all the exposed services, which is quite common these days, isn't it? And it's also got some HVI units on it, which, you know, it's a little bit same job. Surface mounted, um, vertical. Okay, so again, you get more output from the vertical panel. Your proportion of radiance and convective changes, so it becomes 50-50. So your output goes up, but and the proportion of radiance convective changes. So this, um, it's, as you said before, 350 watts becomes 175 of each. Atrium, it's a good way of heating it, the atrium on each level. And that's got, uh, this one's got a slot diffuser integrated into it. So if you blow air across a hot surface or a cold surface, you obviously increase the, the output from it. So that's that's the, and the one on the right's got a, just got a sprinkler in it. And that's pretty much it. So hopefully, oh, so a few things that you can do. Stun silence. Any questions? You mentioned that, um, the example of a window to peak the window. Yes. So it's like you must lose heat through the window as well. You must radiate the field. Because I know the sun radiates in the field, window, so I guess the system is also it's radiates it, out. Yes, it warms the surface, so yeah, it's like everything it can, it can lose the sun. But it, the idea, it'll, it'll heat the whole, you see um, uh, a surface underneath the radiant panel will possibly be about 25 or 26 degrees. So that's how much it'll radi uh, warm it up for. Um, so it might only warm the window up to 23 or 24 degrees, but you're still increasing the, the temperature of the window. So, so if you've got a, an old glass wall, would you still be recommending um, the radiant system? I'd recommend they change the windows personally, but yeah, it would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it will work. It, 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 it will work. Okay. But because you'll take it, you would take into account the heat loss from it. So you. You, you will take into account that there are windows uh, in your heat loss, so your panels will cover that. Any idea what the, the loss is compared with the wood there? It's, it's collapsing so Any idea what sort of loss you lose to that? It's not only in service of a new panel, is I don't know. So you can change the temperature, so it's a reverse calculation. This is right, it's not convicted, yeah. it's a new panel. Uh, the heat loss will be dependent on your view factor. Yeah. From the up angle, so radiant heat is trying to depend on the view factor from the surface, the surface and the emissivity of the surface that's uh, on the receiving end. Yeah. 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 Ye
that's, some, that's a quite high, that's very, very, going to be variable dependent on the glazing and type of the CT. That's one you think is still outside the front of the Along the tramps, I mean, it stops. It, um, you know this thing about it being on the spectrum between ultraviolet and infrared. There's this thing about you know like the greenhouse. You, it, um, it shines in one way, but not out the other way, doesn't it? So I suspect the model something about the, the uh, light waves that you know, don't penetrate glass. So. I, I don't know. The, the, the short answer is good. I don't know. But that's my thoughts on it. The whole point of it is that we're, we're trying to warm up the surfaces around us and, and reduce the temperature difference between us and the, and the external surface and to reduce the heat loss that way. That's how, that's how it works. Yeah. 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 Okay, I've, uh, we've got some samples, so please, if you want to come and have a look at the panels, you're more than welcome to feel them and touch them. I have an em 14 of um, as long as nobody's got photographic photograph of anyone, and takes away some of our secrets. And you're welcome to have a look at that as well. Um, so yeah, um, we we like to try and do some uh, feedback forms as well, just to we try and um, keep things fresh and relevant. So if you wouldn't mind uh, just being nice to Neil. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks very much, Neil. I okay. appreciate it. Um, you just show appreciation for Neil and the guys from Linda. So that's this week's seminar. We've got the next seminar is on the 12th of October and it's on lift standards or elevators, whatever you want to call them. Um,